Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Misplaced from the Joined series. This is book two by Mara Gann, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. Something was tickling my feet. It was something I became aware of slowly, like the vague feelings of being hungry or thirsty. There was no immediate shriek of being tickled, just a slow dawning awareness of discomfort around my toes. I hated being tickled. I kicked out at whoever was doing it, but my feet found nothing. Other sensations began to grab my attention away. My face was pressed into warm, damp sand, the coarse grain scratching my cheek, seeping into my eyes and nose, making me want to sneeze. I could feel it in my ears and hair, little seeds of discontent that I would no doubt spend days washing out. A sand flea, or two or three million, hopped about my face and hands. I don't think I liked sand. I definitely didn't like sand fleas. Did anyone like sand fleas? My stomach was aching and my back muscles screeched in pain. This became more urgent as the deep unpleasantness of having been lying on my stomach for longer than I knew became unbearable, and I quickly rolled over and coughed. Sand. In my mouth. Yuck. I spit out bits of sand and flopped on my back, feeling immensely sore and uncomfortable. I realized that the thing tickling my toes was, in fact, the sea, lapping gently against the sand and my feet. My knees were bent, so I straightened out and shoved my feet all the way into the gentle surf, letting the warm water soothe my itchy soles. A warm sea? I tried to take stock of my body. Everything hurt. I was soaked, although the bright sun was beginning to warm and dry my battered black tunic, so at least I wasn't cold. My back and stomach ached from lying face down, my scalp itched from sand and salty seawater, and my skin had that overly dry feeling from having been in the sea for too long. My legs ached like I'd been running or swimming for days, and my stomach growled with an empty complaint. When had I gone swimming? I couldn't remember having gone swimming. I couldn't remember the last time I'd eaten either. Blinking, I stared up at the deep blue sky, the sun high on the horizon, its rays baking my face. I frowned, not liking the burning feeling, and covered my face with my arm. Even the sun felt unfamiliar. I pushed myself to a sitting position, feeling my muscles groan in protest, and tried to let my eyes adjust to the horrendous, dazzling glare. The fog in my brain intensified. Everything was so bright that it hurt. I liked the warmth of the sun, but I didn't like the brightness that came with it. It felt like needles stabbing my eyes. As my eyes grew accustomed to the intensity, however, I couldn't help admiring the jaw-dropping beauty. I was alone on a white sand beach, a deep green-blue sea yawning before me. The sun glittered and sparkled on the calm waves, sending more stabbing feelings into my eyes but I couldn't quite care when it was this beautiful. I couldn't remember ever having seen something so striking. No, I cared about the stabbing, but it was still beautiful. I was in a small cove with a sheer limestone cliff to my right. The cliff sloped downward toward the middle of the cove and a sandy path led up into a copse of eucalyptus trees. At the ed edge of the cove, the clear blue-green water gently nibbled away at the rock. The headache sliced through my skull just then, reminding me that I was in pain pretty much everywhere. Closing my eyes, I pinched the space between my eyes and breathed deeply, through my nose and out my mouth, several times. It helped a little, but I needed food, water, and some sleep. I leaned my head on my knees, trying to take a deep breath. God, I felt awful. Taking another long, deep breath, I opened my eyes again and made the decision to stand and find something to eat. And that's when I realized something. I didn't know where to go to find something to eat. I didn't know where to go to find something to drink. I didn't even know where to start looking. I searched my mind and a mild panic set in as I realized something else. My name was Maida. It was my name, right? Did I know my name? All that seemed to be left in my head was that word. Maida and the vague indication that it was somehow what people called me. Why did I know that, but not how to get food or water or 
or how I even got here or where here even was. I could feel panic shaking in my chest and my throat working violently as the shattering anxiety of that one little word set in. Perhaps that wasn't something to panic over, but that was it. My name was all I knew. That was the only thing I could remember. Just my name. Maida. Chapter 1. Two months later. For someone who hated breaking the law, I sure was doing it a lot lately. To be fair, the only thing I was doing was stealing, but still. I strolled past the various market stalls, noting the fruits, vegetables, and more fill filling items like flatbread and salted cheese, and took careful note of which merchants were paying close attention. The portly cheese merchant was busy wrangling his goats and yelling at his assistant, all while selling his wares to the crowds of people. But he looked remarkably observant for all that he was multitasking. He was probably used to his goat stealing cheese, I supposed. Which was supremely weird the more I thought about it. Okay, no stealing cheese today. I kept going, weaving my way through the hordes of sweaty peasants, merchants, and sailors. The stench of dirty people was especially pungent now that the weather had grown hotter. Merchants who could afford perfume tried to mask body odors with scents made from myrrh oil or lilies, but when the heat was this intense, perfume didn't help much. It was kind of scattering flowers on dung, frankly. I covered my mouth, trying not to inhale as smells wafted by me, but kept my slow pace to avoid attracting too much attention. I noted that, like the cheese merchant, the fruit merchant was quite observant today. I didn't mind that, though, since I could gather fruit from some of the isolated orchards to the east of here. So long as I did it at night, when the owners were asleep, I managed to stay out of trouble. Besides, his wife had eyes like staring into a glass of milk, and I felt too much guilt over stealing from a farmer and his nearly blind wife. Keiko and I had relocated several weeks ago to a cave nearby, one that afforded a much better location for our clandestine activities, and I'd been to this market only a few times before. That was both a good thing and a bad thing. <clears throat> a good thing because few here knew me or that I had been a bit of a troublemaker in the towns on the north side of the island. But a bad thing because I was pretty sure that it was the last town on the island that didn't know me. Which meant that soon I'd have to start resorting to more extreme tactics. At least the enormity of this city made it anonymity that much easier. I had tried to get a job, I really did, but no one wanted to hire someone with no family, no friends, no discernible skills, and no past to speak of. At best, I was likely incompetent, and at worst, what if I were a murderer? And I could hardly reassure them because honestly, I didn't know if I was a murderer or not. I didn't think I was, but how did I know for sure? It's not like I'd been given any kind of ID card or a handbook or anything. I had yet to discover any practical skills. I couldn't sew, I couldn't fish. For goodness sake, I could barely chop vegetables. I most certainly could not cook. I was kind of useless, something of which Keiko enjoyed reminding me of constantly. I had quickly realized too that I was better off not getting an official job anyway because it turned out I had pretty, some pretty strange abilities that no one else seemed to have the kind that I didn't think I would be wise to share. My skills were a little too weird for public consumption, especially on an island with as little tolerance and as much superstition as Thera. I sighed and rubbed my forehead, thinking of how hungry I was. There was a castagna nut stall at the end of the block, with round nuts roasting on a flat pan over a fire, and the merchant seemed absent-minded enough that I might be able to swipe a snack or two. I might burn my hand a bit in the process, but it was either that or nothing. I stopped to survey the bread stand, knowing I was doing little more than causing myself pain. The smell of freshly baked flatbread made my inside squeeze, nodding with the knowledge that I couldn't pay for it. But I paused to look all the same, pretending I was a possible customer and the many other locals who were shouting and, and haggling. I doubted I looked believable since my clothes were most certainly not of the merchant or even farmer class. My linen tunic was an off-white, overused bit of fabric that I'd found, uh, all right, stolen, over a month ago. I had cut a hole for my head in the middle, wrapped it around me a few times, and tied a borrowed leather cord at my waist. It fell to just past my knees, and I covered everything that I wanted to be covered, and left my arms mostly bare, which was a bonus in this crazy hot weather. 
Most people of the working class wore a ma more manicured version of my tunic in varying colors of white, reds, and blues. The more money someone had, the more colors adorned their clothing. Dyes were expensive. Women often wore full-length tunics, but with the summer heat, most everyone had opted for something shorter. I wasn't wearing shoes, but then few people here did, so that was hardly different for me. I had found a pair of old leather sandals by the side of the road several weeks back and wore those off and on, but now I tried to use them only when I really needed to. My feet, clearly unused to being barefoot in my previous life, had been extremely tender and sensitive to every little rock and thorn at first. But now I was mostly okay without shoes, so long as I was careful and paid attention to where I stepped. The sandals were a bit big for me anyway, making any emergency escapes a bit complicated. My biggest problem blending in even here in the large city of Akrotiri had been my hair. Most everyone had fully tanned skin and dark curly hair. Men often shaved most of it, while women usually bundled, bundled it up in an elaborate hairstyle I could never hope to emulate. I had mostly covered my too obvious reddish blondish hair in another shred of fabric that I salvaged. Many people wore their hair tied up or partially covered, especially now in the hotter months. So that didn't make me stand out either, and it was far cooler to keep my thick hair off my neck. My, my pale skin was unhideable, but there was little I could do about that. Suffice to say, after months of hard work and not nearly as much wish, washing as I'd like, my disorganized appearance made it look as though I had been sleeping on a cave floor for the past two months. And really, that was because I had been. That was my dirty secret. I was essentially homeless. And not because I was poor, although I was, or lacked skills, although I did, or friendless, also true, but because I had no memory. I had simply awoken on that beach about halfway across the island from this town. No one knew me. No one seemed to be missing a family member matching my description. No one seemed to care either. Strangers were pretty common on Thera, the major trading port that it was. And at least I had a name. I'd heard of shipwreck victims coming to Thera with less than that. But that was it. My name was still the only thing I knew. Uh, okay, that wasn't all I knew. I had a thin braid behind my left ear, which was one of the only things that felt like something I could say was me. So I kept it. I had to redo it every few weeks, but it was a way of holding on to that last vestige of something. What I didn't know, but something. And I had been wounded at some point before arriving here. There was an angry red mark across my ab abdomen, one that ached off and on, but had healed fairly well. It had been stitched up professionally by the looks of it, but could still be somewhat sore from time to time. It had leaked a lot of blood and other icky fluids in that first week, but it was just an angry purple scar now. I had funny eyes, which were impossible to hide, and had convinced the islanders that I was marked. Given the way they treated me, I gathered that implied I was marked by something evil, but I wasn't entirely sure. Best of all, I also had pointed ears, which was completely different from the small rounded ears I could see on people around me. But my thick hair thankfully covered the tips most of the time. I quickly learned to pull the fabric of my headscarf down over my ears for added protection. It muffled my hearing a little, but my hearing was pretty good and the safety was worth it. I had no idea why I was different, but being different was not a good thing here. I'd learned that one the hard way. I touched the tip of my left ear gingerly through the scarf I wore, grimacing at the too recent memory. The only other person who knew about my ears and my strange ability was Keiko. I trusted my brother with my life, even though he was barely a teenager. I hoped Keiko had been able to catch fish or some other kind of food in the last few days because I had run out of options. Waiting for the Castagna merchant to look away, I got ready to burn my hand.